Small Talk with BJ, the podcast where trial attorney and legal commentator BJ Bernstein and her guests discuss the latest issues from around the legal world. BJ is a frequent commentator on television and radio. She's unique in that she not only comments on legal issues, having been lead counsel on numerous high-profile cases of national interest, but her relatable personal style allows the viewer to understand the law behind the headlines and why it's important. Now, here's your host, B.J. Bernstein. Law Talk with B.J. has now recorded over 40 episodes where my focus, of course, is law. I have shared with you the many voices and participants in the legal system, from lawyers in the criminal and civil justice arenas to the judges in the trial and appellate courts. There is, though, another aspect of law, and that is the lawmakers themselves, the legislators who pass the laws that govern and that are tested and enforced by the courts. On May 19th, 2020, there will be an election to determine who will be the Democratic nominee to the United States Senate, who will run against the current United States Senator, David Perdue of the Republican Party, and they will battle it out in November. Over the next few weeks, you will hear directly from several of the candidates running for the U.S. Senate Democratic nomination, including Sarah Riggs Amico, John Ossoff, Ted Terry, and Teresa Tomlinson. These podcasts will allow you to meet the candidates and hear their own voices, their goals, their views on the critical issues and the laws that are passed. Do not take anything I say with each candidate as a personal endorsement. I, of course, as I've done with other political podcasts that I've brought to you, am intentionally not making any donation or endorsing any particular candidate so that I can bring to you their voices, their vision for Georgia and the nation. As we know, it's critical that we get out there and vote. If you haven't registered to vote, the time is now as you're listening this to make arrangements and get that registration done and then plan to vote on May 19th, 2020, if you are going to vote for the nominees for the U.S. Senate. And recall that on May 19th, 2020, you're also going to be voting for some judges who have been the subject of other podcasts. So with that, take a listen and let's meet one of the Senate candidates. Welcome to Law Talk with BJ with my guest, Teresa Tomlinson, who is running for the United States Senate here in Georgia. And welcome to Law Talk with BJ. Well, BJ, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. So for our audience to introduce you, you were the former mayor of Columbus, Georgia, and served two terms, but there's a term limit, so you can't run anymore. And now you're setting your eyes on the United States Senate. Right. What brings you to be ready to run? Yeah. Well, uh, even before I was in elected office, I was a, an attorney uh, for 16 years, practiced in the federal court system predominantly, specializing in something called complex litigation. So it was my job to take the laws that the federal legislator, uh, legislature had passed and to um, bring justice to a whole lot of people through those laws. So truth and lending laws, real estate settlement practices laws, all, all kinds of things. So I'm I'm very familiar with um, the legislative process. Because um, there's a there's yeah. a big difference, and for our listeners, you know, we have the state courts yes and we have the federal courts and we've talked about that some on the podcast and sometimes people get confused yeah. um, yes. and there is a big difference in terms of because you know when you're enacting laws in georgia it's just affecting us but right. obviously in congress and the senate it is it's a broader broader. Uh, broader circumstance and so it's all about government though and so as an attorney i was implementing government, the laws of, of, of our federal government uh, for the betterment of the lives of the people that I was representing. And so that was one aspect of government. And then, of course, I had the opportunity to serve as the mayor of Columbus, Georgia, uh, where I saw sort of a different side of it from an executive position. Uh, being mayor is, um, you know, full time, all the time job. You don't have the luxury of shutting down the government when you're mayor because you're 
constituents know where you live. Uh, <laughs> they get up, they expect their city to be running every single day. There's no, not a lot of room for the political ego um, in that regard. And so, uh, you know, I really got a taste and, and enjoyed making government work for people. Uh, and I've, I've always been somebody that's had a deep respect. I say all the time that the United States government is the greatest civic invention mankind has ever known, and it matters very much who runs it. And so I set my sights on this particular race because I felt that the incumbent, who's David Perdue in this instance, was particularly vulnerable. And I also felt like people were exhausted with the dysfunction they're experiencing in D.C., uh, and they're hungry for somebody who can make it work again. And that's my particular wheelhouse is making government work. That's what I did as an attorney. And that's what I did um, as mayor of Columbus, Georgia. Can you share with us some examples sure. that worked in Columbus first since, you, you know, where you were mayor and you were directing? Things? Yeah. It, you know, there were so many things that were going on when I stepped in uh, to being mayor in Columbus. It's a minority majority community. We were transitioning uh, to be in, in our instance, it's an African-American majority community um, that was uh, causing some civic disruption as it was new, a new time for people. And we had a power structure that was different. Different, uh, than our uh, constituency looked. And so one of the things I ran on actually was race and changing the power structure to look more like the people. Um, so one of the things I did was, uh, you know, help make sure that our appointments to the 40 something boards, more than that actually, um, looked more like the people that we represented. Uh, but also some of the more functional aspects of it that you would think of. We had a pension that was failing. It was um, you know, 70, less than 72% funded when I came in. Uh, when I left, it was over 96% funded because we had to completely reform it. We saved the taxpayers $55 million and yet kept the defined benefit plan, which is the gold standard. Um, we reformed, um, you know, also our criminal justice system. Uh, we had one of the largest work camps in Columbus, which is a state prison system, as you may know. Uh, so we don't have a lot of authority to just go in and change things. Um, but the work camps basically field what they call trustees, uh, low-grade felony prisoners, uh, to go out and do works uh, in the community. And of course, that's a very politically volatile subject right now. People are very concerned about that, uh, that people who are serving time would be used to, quote, save taxpayer money. So one of the things I had frank conversations with the citizens telling them that, that this current construction of the um, criminal justice system in the state of Georgia is going to be changing, either through political force or through legal holdings that stop this 20th century use of work camp labor uh, for like public Like what you good. see on the side of the, you know, yes, the picking, picking up trash, picking up trash mowing the grass, of things of that type. So, but I did as mayor, I was also public safety director. So the head of the police department, fire department, and also um, the prison. So I was able to hire a new warden, uh, change the leadership of the prison. And we actually began to implement policies through our crime prevention program that took that work camp construct that the state had, and we turned it into a rehabilitation and job training effort. So what we did was partnered with Columbus Tech, uh, Columbus Technical College, uh, so that uh, prisoners who were working with certified plumbers and electricians were able to get certifications that they had had that type of apprenticeship. Uh, we began soft skills training at the prison itself. Hundreds and hundreds of prisoners participated in that. Um, we also had the highest GED completion rate of any work camp in the state of Georgia because we made that a priority. Um, and so we really took the time. We began, I banned the box early on uh, in, in my first term. And so we began to hire our own people, people who had been in prison working these jobs uh, for the citizenry. When they got out, when they had paid their debt, uh, we got them into and hired them for those jobs. Uh, and so, you know, you see the criminal justice system working in a way that has a rehabilitative effect. Um, and, and I think that's the type of innovative thinking we need to take, not just statewide, but frankly, nationally. We need to shed ourselves of these 20th century 
constructs and step fully into the 21st century. And that's interesting you're yeah. talking about that because, you know, the Department of Justice have granted certain regions, I think it's North Carolina, Louisiana, um, project safe neighborhoods in order to reduce crime yes. and work with people as opposed to just locking them away yes. and making sure that they all come together. And it sounds like you were already doing a micro version yes. in your in your city in which you were mayor. Right, exactly. And 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 I think that, you know, if we don't change the construction of this work camp, first of all, like I said, there's going to be a political revolt about it um, because it's just an outdated um, system that we presently have. But it really takes a very, a, a very small change in perspective to see this as a potential job training opportunity. Um, and, uh, and and that's what we had in Columbus, and it worked, and we could do even more, though it wasn't our particular system. It was the state prison system. We were just sort of shepherds, local shepherds of it. But even with the limited authority and jurisdiction that we had, we were able to make such an impact that it's certainly something that could be replicated. Uh, and I will tell you this, with the private prison system, uh, it cost about $44 a day to house a prisoner. Um, with the public prison system, it's about $21, $22 a day. You could, with that type of savings, implement an even more robust training system. And so save us money and, and, and have that amazing impact of returning people to the community after having served their time as great family resources for their own family. Uh, community resources, but also economic resources in addition to the great human resources they already are. And in the criminal justice community, these privatized prisons has been mm -hmm. much talked about yes. and, and, a lot, and a lot of concern. I, I know just even for practicing attorneys and I go see clients at those facilities, it's very hard to get in. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of barriers, the cost to call, um, everything to make money as if, you know, Instead of we we are best with people out working, and instead mm -hmm. um, we're we're paying and they're making money. Yes, and nobody's winning. They're grossly private prison systems are grossly inefficient, and they also are wrought for abuse because with abuse because they don't have the same transparency levels that we have when we're running the public prison systems. Um, as you said, they, they tend to be more closed. Um, it is just something that we need to get, you know, this business that we have of thinking everything's better privatized is just not true. Uh, whenever you have to inject a, a, a private profit motive into a particular industry or sector, um, then you're adding to the cost of it. Uh, so in the public sector, see, we don't have to make money off of our, we don't have any CEOs to pay. We don't have to make our quarterly earnings to satisfy our stockholders, our investors. Um, you know, we can run at cost. And and so we are more efficient, meaning the municipality, the state, the government is more efficient at certain things such as prisons than the private sector could ever be. And we need to understand that there's profiteering going on. There's gross inefficiencies with these private prison systems. But more than that, they are, um, they are environments that are just ripe for abuse. I'm going to transition yes. a little bit to voting rights. Yes, um, and you've written extensively about you know what how you can make sure or things that could be changed at the federal level to assure fairness in our voting. Um, obviously, there's always cause for concern and has been over the years about um, and with the <laughs> with the internet and electronics and concern of hacking and then or denying people their right to vote by yes. putting all these obstacles mm -hmm. in front of them. Do you have any platform on that? Yes, I do. Um, in fact, I've written 14 position papers. I think I'm the only candidate anywhere who's put it on paper. You know, these consultants will tell you, my God, don't put it on paper. You might have to change what you think to meld your positions to um, the current day political opinion. But the fact of the matter is I've been doing this a long time, not just leading, but speaking about um, public policy and so as to voting rights and many of these other things, I said, well, there's no putting the toothpaste back in the tube. I have two or more decades of, of um, conferences and papers and editorials I've written out of there, so might as well write it down. And one is on voting rights. So one of the most fundamental concepts of being an American is that there's one person, one vote. Uh, but what we have done through, really, there, some people are even 
um, do it with amusement, this game, they think, of 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 um, political chess, of Dungeons and Dragons uh, for politics. They um, have come up with everything from gerrymandering to these voter suppression techniques, um, some that are very technical and specific, uh, such as exact match, legislative. Others are just discouraging people from voting, um, creating situations where there's long lines. Uh, you have to be so motivated to change your day just to go vote, but when you have to stand in line for four hours, um, that's a whole other thing. When you even think that you might have to stand in line for four hours, that will deter you from voting. Um, and so we have created this atmosphere of suppression and marginalization of our own people that history will remember this moment. And, and people need to guard now and understand uh, that their position on this will be remembered in the future. And so I have written about the fact that we need to apply the Voting Rights Act to all 50 states. Um, it, it was, as you know, just applicable to those states who had, um, you know, segregationist Jim Crow um, uh, histories. And that's why one of the excuses the United States Supreme Court used in, in throwing out um, the voting rights section, which applied to preclearance. Um, but we need to bring back preclearance. Go ahead and, and, and when you say preclearance, let's explain by the Justice Department. Minister. Yes. So the way it works now is that if a state or locality wants to change something like a closing voting precincts um, or doing it, gerrymandering, changing lines for voting districts, they ha used to have to go through a process, which the Justice Department had to approve to make sure it didn't have any racial impact, a disparate impact. And um, and so with a Supreme Court decision, uh, that was thrown out. And um, and, and it was the, the Holder position. It was during the, the Obama administration. So Eric Holder was um, was, a, was a party to the lawsuit. And, um, and and it was Shelby County versus versus Holder. And uh, and, and so they basically threw out that preclearance. And so now um, you can do anything you want. And that's when they started all that we saw coming to bear in 2018, the Stacey Abrams, Brian Kemp election. All of the shenanigans was a direct result of throwing out preclearance uh, in that particular Supreme Court decision. But, but my point's broader than that. We've got to change it in Georgia, absolutely, and we are doing a lot. A lot of work has been done since 2008. But we have to amend the Voting Rights Act to apply to all 50 states because these shenanigans are also going on in places like North Dakota where they're marginalizing the Native American Indian population um, in, in jurisdictions in southwest United States where they're marginalizing generational Hispanics, not, not just people who've come in recently. I'm talking about people who, are, you know, are here th three generations and, and they're being, you know, tasked with uh, extraordinary difficulties just to, to get their vote counted. That's not the way it should be in this country. And so there's there's a lot to be done. Um, but amending the Voting Rights Act is, is most certainly one of the things we have to look at. Let's talk about health care laws yes. for a minute. W where do you stand? What is your position with regard to where we are in the health care system and how what can be made better? Yeah. Well, you know, one of the things, again, that we have to admit to ourselves, because there's there's all these fallacies that have come up over the last several decades. But but one of the fallacies is that somehow um, the government being involved in, in health care um, negatively impacts the private market, uh, you know, and, and we just need to admit right now that the healthcare industry has never been a properly functioning private market because there's too many anomalies. You are not going to sit down and haggle over price when your kid's life is at stake. Yeah, or you present yourself to the emergency exactly. room. You just, you're, you're, you're unconscious. There and you just they get need, to work on you. Right, and, and saying you're not going to go shop around uh, when you've been in a farming accident and you're bleeding from a major artery. Um, you know, it's ridiculous uh, that we've allowed ourselves to fall for this these illogical um, cynical arguments being made on the other side. If there was ever an industry that is in dire need of part of of public partnership, of governmental framework, it is the healthcare industry because it's so vital uh, to your physical existence, but also to your continuing economic 
stability. And so, um, and so some of the things that I've talked about is uh, the government, universal health care, the government being involved in such things as expanding uh, Medicare to possibly one of the proposals I've put on the table and is now 25 years old, so I certainly didn't invent it, but expanding Medicare to 55. Uh, we know how much that would cost. We know that we can administratively handle that expansion at this time. Um, it, we, we know exactly how it would be rolled out because it's been studied so much since the Clinton era, frankly. And then uh, we know what it would save us as well. So it would take some of the most costly participants in the healthcare industry out of the private market, put them into Medicare, which would then reduce the cost for private insurance because now the most costly individuals have been removed from that market. Um, it would also help Medicare because now you've put the lower cost younger people into Medicare. So you have, have now um, improved that market. Um, but but some of the other things we've got to tackle, um, prescription drug costs, obviously. Um, and we also need to, I've proposed, uh, taking away the state veto of Medicaid expansion by just going ahead and having the federal government assume 100 cents on the dollar of the cost of Medicaid. As you may know, right now, the federal government has, it's the leg legislation is that the federal government will pay 90 cents on the dollar for Medicaid expansion to 138 percent of the poverty level. And um, so if you live at 138 percent of the poverty level or less, you will be eligible for Medicaid. Um, and there's been 17 states that have rejected that, including Georgia, which has left 650,000 of our people uncovered. Other states have taken advantage of this. Um, but because the states have a 10% requirement match, they have the right of veto. Um, well, my position is that these are United States citizens. They live within these states. Uh, but when the federal government has provided that they will pay for a federal program um, because the livelihood, <laughs> economic and, and, and the literal livelihood of their citizens depend on it, um, then it should be expanded and not used as a political football. And that's what's happened in these 17 states is to make some point that Barack Obama didn't have it right in their opinion. They've denied hundreds and hundreds of thousands of their own citizens access to basic health care coverage. And, and we must stop that immediately. Going back to some criminal things again. Sure. Um, marijuana's legislation. Yeah. What, what are your positions there? Obviously, you know, there's a lot of cry for medical marijuana. Then yeah. There are other people who use it for recreational purpose, uh, purposes. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, we have a lot of people who are convicted of yeah. something that a, a lot of people consider equivalent to alcohol, in essence. This is such, it's, you know, it's such a, an adult issue. And, and, and we act like, it's so, it's too many people act like we're talking about, let's all go toke up. And, and they make fun of it, really. Um, and, and they think that you're being, quote, liberal or, or you know, whatever phrase they want to tag on it. We have a situation in this country where 33 states have legalized marijuana in some way, shape, or form for medicinal use, uh, uh, for recreational use, or for medicinal and recreational use. And yet, at the federal level, it's absolutely unlawful. And so we have created this federal umbrella in which 33 states are violating the law, and anyone who's traveling among those states or any of the others is violating the law. Um, and and this is a quintessential federal issue of legalizing marijuana, taking it off of Schedule 1 uh, so that the states can do what they wish to do. But I have proposed that the federal government needs to regulate it, just like it did when we with alcohol when we came out of prohibition. And, and so there's a system and a history. We know what works. We know what didn't work well. We know where we created black markets and, and we can we can correct that the second time around. And so my proposal is to add marijuana legalization to the ATF, or, or if you want to put it somewhere else, fine. But let's just say for the moment for discussion, uh, add it to the ATF. Uh, allow, because we're going to have pricing disparities among the states um, that create can create trafficking, black markets, 
you know, market anomalies, all sorts of things, uh, just like it did with alcohol when it first, you know, came out of prohibition. And so we need to be serious about this. We need to be adult about this. We need to go ahead and understand that we've got to help create this market that's many, most of the states already participating in. You bring up that we've, we have people in jail today uh, for things that would not be illegal today. Right. Um, and so we have to go back and have the, um, you know, and have, um, you know, the clemency for those particular um, uh, sentencing, um, expungement of their records so these people can get out and have full and healthy lives, um, gain, be gainfully employed. Uh, and so there is a system which we could easily employ um, by simply saying, you know, we're going to people who are in prison for things that are not now illegal uh, will get out of prison and uh, we will work to correct their record so that this is not does not mar their ability to get a job going forward. And it's important what you're saying about the record. And I'm going to kind of reference, you know, we have the first steps program in the federal system and it's been made famous because Kim Kardashian's involved. And, you know, it from a criminal defense lawyer, you know, obviously that's excellent, except for we're only talking about 80 to 100 people who it's affected now. Mm -hmm. And there are so many more people who could potentially benefit for um, an expansion of that and a real honest look at mandatory minimums yes. and how we sentence things because we got so worried that things were unfair that we set these guidelines we're also forgetting that people have individual experiences, they have mental health issues, they were abused. There are things that may lead to why they have done something and, you know, whether we treat it to end it or whether incarceration and just locking people away forever. Yeah. Um, how do you feel about, you know, expanding that program or other shifts on the federal level? Right. Well, um, I, I've talked about getting rid of the mandatory minimums and and going back to trusting the judgment of the judges, uh, the prosecutors and the defense lawyers that are involved in these cases, because as you said, there are too many individual circumstances um, to have such. You can certainly have sentencing guidelines, and we've we've had sentencing guidelines for many many years, um, and we can go back to that. And and if some judge was to get so far out of line, then there's there's opportunities for as you know appeal and and other things. And if there was a judge that was particularly abusive, of course you have all sorts of um, judicial oversight committees and things that that step in to act. And and in many cases, judges are um, actually. Uh, voted on. So <laughs> you can also take it to the ballot box. Um, but the mandatory minimums have across the board been something um, that that we can show scientifically um, through, you know, there's statistical evidence that there is a racially disparate impact to these mandatory minimums. And, and we have got to, and some of it comes from, um, as we know, and has been well reported, the difference between crack cocaine and, and, and powder cocaine. And some of that was uh, rectified with the uh, Fair Sentencing Act, as you know, in 2010, and then, of course, was retroactively applied in the First Step Act that you were talking about. Um, but there's still a ways to go. And um, and so I think returning to the judge's discretion, the prosecutor's discretion uh, through sentencing guidelines, we'd be much better served. Well, I want to encourage our listeners to le read more on your website, yes. TeresaTomlinson.com, T-E-R-E-S-A-T-O-M-L-I-N-S-O-N.com. Um, before I leave you and tell you why I picked your T, um, <laughs> is there anything else you want to just tell the voters in general while I have you here yeah. to close out? I would just say, you know, this is such an important time in this country. I had a gentleman tell me when I was on the tour of Georgia, he said, Teresa, I just want to go back to the day where I can take government for granted again. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we believe for so long that whether we voted for person A or B, uh, you know, it, it may not be the person that we voted for who won, but it, the the country wasn't going to be uh, run off the rails. And, and I'm not trying to be overly dramatic, but I think that this great democracy of ours is being tested to the breaking point. And I think that putting people in office who who, first of all, acknowledge that government has a role in our life and that it, it does create the framework in which we live our most prosperous life and understanding that who runs it matters and understanding that our government is an ever-evolving tool that can keep up with our lives if it's being run correctly. Um, so don't give up on our government. It's us. 
that you know that's the beauty of of this government is that it's us um and and i think if if government is failing us it's because of who we're sending to run it and so contemplate that as you go to the polls and understand that this is a critically important time that we as a nation have invested almost 240 years in and this is not the time to end this great experiment it's the time to double down and reinvest in it. And so I ask people to get engaged, to believe in what's made this country great, and to understand your power as a citizen in the fact that this is your government and, and you get to choose how it's led. Well, thank you for joining me. And we've been enjoying a cup of tea and on yes. every episode. We are having a bergamot lemongrass tea. Um, and I chose this one for you because of the bergamot. And there are everybody different spiritual and and beliefs with regard to teas and this tea is for inner confidence and courage and i think that is perfect for um obviously you you are passionate about your views you have an agenda and as i said it's on your website um, you have listed out a great lot of a lot of detail things we couldn't even get to with regard to labor and employment, climate change, health, vote, all the things we've talked about, firearms. Yes. Um, so I want you to look there, but there is courage. Just you know, not just say you want to change the world, but that you're going to try to run and and represent and advocate for people. So thank you for joining me thank on you, Law BJ. Talk with BJ, and to our listeners, remember May nineteenth. Um, whether it's Teresa Lee Tomlinson or someone else, there are going to be several important races on um, to determine who the Democratic candidate is, who will be running against Senator, our current Senator Purdue. And so get out there and vote regardless of your views and tune into the other podcasts so that you and, and research for yourself. Um, it is imperative that we participate and that the voting numbers go up so that all of us go and have a voice. So thank you. Thank you so much. This podcast is not to be construed as legal advice. With any legal issue, you should reach out to a professional attorney that practices law in the state and area of law for which you need information or consultation. Law Talk with BJ does not establish an attorney-client relationship, which is only formed when you have hired an attorney and signed an engagement agreement or contract. It's Law Talk with BJ music theme written and produced by Atlanta Audible. This podcast copyright 2018, BJ Bernstein Esquire.